Hessian matrix is an important element of numerical optimization techniques that we use to calculate maximum likelihood estimates. Hessian matrix is something that can be also useful to inspect when you have convergence problems. Let's take a look at what is Hessian matrix and why it can be useful for diagnosing model, non-convergence and particle and model identification issues. The first time an applied researcher sees the term Hessian is probably in this context. So you might have your statistical software printing out warnings related to Hessian or you might have some output from uh, the maximum likelihood estimation where in addition to printing out the likelihood, the computer prints out some lines about Hessian matrix something. So uh, let's take a look at what the Hessian matrix is. I have another video where I explain the Hessian matrix in more detail, but the idea is simply this. So uh, understanding the Hessian matrix is useful to start from understanding what is convergence. And uh, normally when we do maximum likelihood estimation, it is kind of like climbing on, on top of a mountain. And we must have a rule to determine whether we are on the top. And one commonly used rule is that we are on the top when the ground below our feet is flat and it curves down to all directions. So the point here is that we cannot take uh, a step to any direction and go up anymore. We would always go down. And uh, the, the slope, the, the flatness, is stored in, in the, uh, the, the gradient vector, which contains the first derivatives of the problem, so slopes. And the curvature is stored in the Hessian matrix, which contain the second partial derivatives of the problem. When we try to when we visualize a Hessian matrix, it's useful to take a look at different surfaces. So this would be a, a surface. We have a, a maximum likelihood surface here, and this is for an estimation problem where we are trying to estimate the standard deviation and mean of a normal distribution for some sample. And uh, that's the standard deviation, and this is the mean. And we can see that the maximum of the likelihood is, is around here when standard deviation and mean are at certain values. So this is we're trying to find the maximum, the values of standard deviation and mean for this normal distribution that makes they are their likelihood as large as possible. When we look at this same problem from the top-down perspective, like a map, we can see that there are these contour lines. So the map uh, points that there is there's just one peak. When we uh, travel uh, across the contour lines, we go up and then we are eventually on the peak. And this is a well-behaved problem. We would call that the Hessian for this problem is negative definite. It simply means that when we are on the top here, then it curves down to all directions. Another example would be a Hessian matrix that is not uh, negative definite. So uh, we might have a problem like this. So uh, the mean is identified, but the standard deviation is not. For example, if there's no variance in the data, then uh, the, uh, the standard deviation couldn't be calculated. If our sample size is like one, we might calculate mean, but no standard deviation. So uh, we have this ridge here. So uh, all values of S are equally likely. We can only estimate this M here. If we look at it from the top, then the contour lines on a, on a map would be straight. We can go up here, but we can see that there's this ridge here along which all values of, of M in, all values of S are equally likely to produce uh, the observed data. So briefly, the Hessian matrix tells us to which direction this, this plane or this surface curves. Now, let's go to a practical example. And I'm going to be estimating this model here and then showing uh, the Hessian matrix, how we can use the Hessian matrix to understand uh, why this is not identified. And we have these two factors, F1 and F2. We estimate a model where F1 is regressed on F2, F2 uh, is regressed on F1, and each factor has three indicators. The degrees of freedom are positive, but this model is not identified because we have just one latent variable correlation. And, and as a general rule, you can't estimate two things, two regression paths from one correlation. So estimating this kind of reciprocal paths generally requires the use of instrumental variables, which are not available in this example. Our data comes from UCLA. This is an example of how you uh, 
can calculate a exploratory factor analysis using confirmatory factor analysis but we'll be using this data set just to run a normal two-factor confirmatory factor analysis or CFA model. And, and this is the data syntax that I've been using. I, I will use, it is uh, a bit complicated, but I'll walk you through it line by line. What we'll start first is that we will estimate this model from a hundred different set of random starting values. So we have this R normal here indicating that we have a random starting value uh, for, for these regression coefficients. The first set of estimates is here. And importantly, there are no warnings here. So everything looks okay, but it is not identified as I explained already. So you can't always trust your software's identification checks. They are not bulletproof. They work most of the time, but sometimes problems like this uh, go undetected. All right. So but if we know, if you know where to look, you might see that these uh, uh, standard errors are very large and uh, that indicates that there is a problem with these two parameters, two regression paths. Generally, if you have a linear model, then identification problems almost always involve a trade-off between two parameters. So if one parameter increases, another one can, must go down. So it is quite often a, a trade-off and if you can fix identification of one parameter then the identification of another one will also uh, be established. If we compare the first seven models estimated from these random starting values we can see that all the factor loadings, all the error variances for the indicators are the same. So these are identified but what we note is that there are regression paths between these two latent variables, they vary from uh, depending on which starting values we apply. And this is an indication of model non-identification. And we also note that the estimates are negatively correlated. So whenever the regression path from F1 to F2 is large, then the regression path from F2 to F1 is, is a, a large negative number. If one is zero, then the other one is also close to zero. So this is a, an interesting feature. They are negatively correlated. To understand more about how these estimates behave together, uh, we'll, uh, we'll save the estimates into file and then uh, we'll do a scatter plot of the two estimates. And uh, so here's the scatter plot. We can see that there are a couple of cases where both estimates are very large in, in the ballpark of 1000. If we take, uh, leave those out, we can see that, okay, so there are a couple of where there are estimates are very small in the, in the minus tens. If we take those out, we can see that except for those four outlying estimates, this is what the estimates look like. So we have two estimates that are perfectly correlated for a subsample. So, uh, these are perfectly correlated and they all happen to have also the same likelihood value. So, so this is the, uh, the, uh, the, the largest likelihood value that we can get using these data. And all these other likelihoods are smaller, more negative values. So in that case, the computer has not found the ridge here. If we uh, overlay our, our map of, of this ridge line here, we might see that the Hessian looks like that. So there's a ridge, this is not negative definite. And uh, then uh, these are, are not on the peak, so they are, they are uh, or not on the ridge, they are, are smaller values than the values on the peak, but the values on the peak are equally likely. So how would we then uh, know based on looking at a single set of estimates what the problem is? If we repeat the estimates from multiple different starting values and then we plot the estimates, we can get this kind of nice, nice plot that illustrates the problem that there is a trade-off between these two parameters. But this is a, a bit of work to do. We can actually do uh, uh, it more easily. So let's take a look at these estimates again. So based on these estimates, how would we uh, get more information which parameters are not identified? We can look at the standard errors, but let's say that if there are like six parameters with large standard errors, uh, we wouldn't know which combination of those parameters is the problem. 
they're typically it involves just two parameters. What we can do is that we can print out the covar variance covariance matrix of the estimates, um, mat list EV, so that's the variance covariance matrix. And um, we can see that there are regression paths from F1 to F2 and F2 to F1 are almost perfectly negatively correlated. So this is in the covariance matrix metric, but when the covariance is in the same ballpark as are the variances, then we also know that the correlation must be very close to plus one or minus one. And indeed, if we uh, convert these to correlations, we will see that there is almost perfect negative correlation between the two estimates, which we saw in this plot here. So this is a <clears throat> almost perfect or perfect negative correlation in repeated samples. When we estimate it, it's almost perfect. So uh, you can identify or you can uh, spot where the identification problem is by printing out the variance covariance matrix of the estimates and then check if any estimates are almost perfectly correlated either positively or negatively. If a pair of estimates is perfectly correlated then both of those estimates can't be estimated from the same data. So you have to adjust the model or if it's empirical under identification which is a sample specific problem then collect more data. Sometimes the problem is so severe that you don't get estimates. So you, if you don't have estimates, then you can't calculate this estimate variance covariance matrix. So what do you do then? Well, what you can do is um, print out the, uh, the gradient vector and the Hessian matrix. And uh, this is the printout. It looks pretty, pretty intimidating uh, in the, uh, for a beginner, but we have the gradient here. The gradient simply contains uh, the, uh, the slope. So is the ground flat under our feet when we are at the, at the presumed maximum? All these values should be close to zero. If they are not close to zero, then you have a problem with that specific parameter. Generally, they are always when the computer declares convergence or when the computer stops estimating, they are pretty much always close to zero. So uh, finding problems here is not that common. Then we have the Hessian matrix, which tells us something about the, the curvature. And uh, we would interpret this the same way like we interpret the variance covariance matrix of the estimates. So we would be looking at values of uh, off diagonal that are large in absolute value compared to the diagonal elements. So the diagonal elements are always uh, negative numbers or almost always a, a non-negative number indicates an identification problem that is specific to a parameter. But most of the time you look at the off-diagonal elements, do you have any large values? And we have a large value here. So the value is comparable to these diagonal elements. This value here is comparable to, to these two diagonal elements. That indicates that there's a problem involving that specific parameter. I have a video about Hessian matrix where I talk about this interpretation in a lot more detail. But this is just a demonstration that you can use Hessian matrix and variance covariance matrix of the estimates to identify if there is this kind of like linear dependency between two parameter estimates, which makes the model not identified. When we take a look at the bigger picture of convergence problems, there are the Hessian matrix and the variance covariance matrix of the estimate is useful for diagnosing these uh, identification problems. It is not that useful for, for troubleshooting uh, uh, problems related to computational issues for which starting values is a more useful tool. Some computational issues might be uh, diagnosed with Hessian matrix, but typically the kind of problems that you find with this technique is identification problems that you can only adjust by adjusting your model or by collecting more data.